I'm Amber Davis and this is your five minute call. This is the space where musical theatre takes centre stage. From unforgettable backstage stories with incredible special guests to insights from my life and my theatre journey. We're leaving it all on the mic every single week so let's jump in. On this episode, we have a Strictly winner and my favourite happy man who I'm working with at the minute. It's the wonderful Aurea Duba. So today, guys, I have one of the most gorgeous human beings sitting here with me. Lucky enough to call him my co-star, my happy man. What? It's the wonderful Aurea Duba. Hi, Ams. Hi, Gorge. I have to say, I've not been, I'm quite nervous. Why? Yeah, because <laughs> because you always make me nervous. You make me anxious. Do I? Why? Yeah, because behavior. No, it's not. It's actually nothing to do with you. You just get things out of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get his deep and darkest Gosh, secrets don't out. Don't go there. It's been lovely because even how we've met has always been quite serendipitous. And I, ever since I've known you. You just bring out the honest me. Yeah. And I'm, all, I'm just myself most around you. And I'm quite nervous about telling other people that, really. <laughs> That's probably why. I love that. I promise you you're safe today. I know I'm safe. And lovely Merlin, who's looking after us over there. Yeah, shout yeah. out to Merlin. Yeah. We're actually, at the minute, we're in Edinburgh doing Pretty Woman. Uh, we're, we're just about to go into our second week, aren't we? Yeah. Ori's had his family here, his gorgeous, gorgeous family. We've had a lovely time. Edinburgh's actually, it's kind of where a lot of my... At working in this industry started because I came to the Edinburgh TV Festival when I was about 20 and so I've I've come here loads and loads of times so I've it's 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 weird that it's like we're a coming. full circle it moment. is quite full every time I come to Edinburgh it feels full circle it, it's just kind of brings everything back down to earth yeah so yeah it's kind of mad that we're doing this wicked show together you and me in front of like up to 3,000 people. 3,000 people. Do you know what? The Playhouse is the second biggest in the UK, isn't yeah. it? The first is the Coliseum. But it is like, there's nothing quite like it, is it? When you, when you go out there. Yeah. There really isn't anything like being out on the stage at all. And I never take any of it for granted, mm. really. I said to one of our crew, Beth, who's, who's my dresser on the team. And she, I mean, I, I speak absolute. Do you do swearsies on this show? Swear? Can I yeah, yeah, you can yeah. swear. I speak absolute shit. <laughs> I'm nervous already. I speak, I speak rubbish to Beth all the time. And so I don't know if she doesn't know, she doesn't know whether I'm being sincere or whether I'm just, I'm just talking crap. But I remember coming off for one of the opening scenes and I do my quick change just before you come on, we do a little high five. And I remember saying to her, do you know, it's mad because every time I come into that theatre and then start our show, regardless of whatever mood I've been in, I always am happy. I love that. I'm always, genuinely, I'm always, as long as my body's not broken, because I'm a bit older now, <laughs> and I do feel it. There was but, eight shows a week. Oh, gosh, it hands like, <laughs> we've had a couple of days off, and I've only just about started feeling myself again. But no, I genuinely, I love starting our show. It's such a feel-good show. Yeah. And I and there's that point where I speak to Beth. She doesn't know if I'm going to say anything useful sincere or I'm <laughs> to talk out my ass again but I genuinely said so I feel always happy yeah talking about so Ori actually is the first person you see on the show well you've got the ensemble coming on but yeah the first bit of script I comes welcome from them on, Ori. I? you welcome everyone yeah so what I'd love to ask you because I ask this to all my guests yeah. is what's your pre-show ritual Ooh, I yeah, I am quite ritualistic. Mm. I like just to be in my own space. And like I've, I've, I've got makeup on and I've done my thing in my room just trying to get myself into the best space. I put the radio on. Yeah. I've always got the radio on, probably blaring out your next door. So if you do hear the radio on, if it's too loud, you should let <laughs> me know. I will let you know. But I'll probably put the radio on just to try to get an idea of like it's live and I, you know, we're going to live theatre. So I like it to be busy in my head. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like it's too closed off. And then like, I, I, it never was supposed to be a ritual, but I always go off to a dark corner. Yes, you the do. start of the show. I don't like to chat. I like to just, <laughs> just to go tell myself, don't fuck it up. <laughs> That's basically all I'm doing for from the minute we've been top cult, we've been called beginners. I'm just telling myself, 
right, what have you got to do? There's 3,000 people out there. What's the first note? Yeah. And just going over the big... Because it's a big deal, like, running out and going, welcome to 3,000 people yeah. on Matching pitch. Matching that energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I always want to make sure that I hit that first impression the yeah. best I can. So that's what I... Yeah, I go off into a little dark corner. And you and I have a little ritual. Yes. He's got, he's got a tiny little beauty spot, or he does, on his hand. Yes, I do. There it is. And before I went away for Dancing on Ice, I'd touch the... I remember. Yeah. I'd touch the, the beauty spot. I think that's lovely of you to call it a beauty spot because others would say freckle or mole. Oh, no, that's but a beauty spot. if you think spot. it's beautiful, yeah. But now we have a little high five in the wing as yeah. you're going to go on. Yeah, we have a little swap in the wing before yeah. in the middle of our opening number. So it's nice. It's cute. It's like it's, a check-in. It us. is a check-in. And it's, it's funny because I'm sure every guest that you've had on the show, you've talked about pre-show ritual, would probably go, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not so... But we are so ritualistic. We're yeah. so kind of... I don't know if OCD is the best label to put for everybody, but if things start going out of place, then the whole world is going to start caving in. Yeah, we um, know about it. Yeah. And, and I certainly feel like if I, I need to keep that, that level of... I, I just... My whole... My whole career, my whole life as, as an adult has probably been quite, like, methodical. Yeah. That's probably the word I would, I would give it, yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I love that because you're the first guest that I've had on that I'm c currently working with. So I like that the Ooh. listeners can listen to what our, you know, relationship is like as co-workers. Yes. <laughs> we are co-workers. Co-workers. Yeah. What is it like working with me, just out of curiosity? Just in, the good, no, the bad, do you know, no, do you know what? I just want it one word. You can't do it in what? It's the best. It is great working with you. Is it? When you're not around, you do notice it. Aww. In the best possible way. I don't need to blow smoke up you. I don't need to, but it's the truth. And you and speak to anybody on this show. Can't speak for your last production, Sam. <laughs> You'll have to ask everybody else. It's well, best. I left my last one with a boyfriend. <laughs> So again, terrible things go into my mind since I was going to say something really inappropriate. This is what I'm saying. I'm not safe to be let loose. <laughs> yeah, I, you are a, an amazing... Do you know, I do remember in rehearsal, I remember speaking to you in the first couple of weeks, and it's such a massive role. And myself and Ollie, who plays Edward, your opposite, your, your leading man in the mm. show, we came to watch Back to the Future and we were so blown away by it by your performance. But then, of course, Vivian's a whole other step up. Yeah. It, is, it is the whole show is about you, let alone the image and trying to replicate Julie, Ro Julie Roberts. Mm. But the big sing, the presence on stage. And I remember watching you in rehearsals and we have such a good laugh, like, off stage and sort of when, when we're not working. But I just remember saying to you, like, I'm so impressed. Just what a, what a level up. Aww. And you are an amazing leading lady on stage, but also as a cast leader. So... Don't cause I'll cry. That's one word for you. Okay, thank you. She's great. My word for you has to be wholesome. Oh, I'll take You're that. the most wholesome. When Ore is around, you, like, immediately feel safe. It's like, oh, I'm going to be fine no matter what because Ore's here. That's very sweet. Yeah. I like to... Well, I mean, I am a dad. Yeah. So I do like to make sure that everyone's okay. Which is a lot, you know, we've got a big company. About yeah, 50, so there's a lot of big responsibility, <laughs> you know, you're looking after us all. But I like to think that people can always come and talk to me. And when, especially when you're a touring company, mm. when you are a group who are on the road, you know, I've been touring since 2017. That was never the plan. Mm. I've been on the road for a really long time and I haven't, I'm still figuring out how to do it. Yeah. But if it's the first time thing, it's so overwhelming. Not least, you know, you're going from different accommodations from different cities and all the rest of it. And everything's so intense. We always talk about the work family, but then, like, a family travelling together it's at intense. closest quarters, working together, having fun together, we drinking only met, together. Bear in mind, we only met six months ago. Literally, we've got we've so, so much water. <laughs> it's passed under the bridge. It's, it's overflowing. The bridge ain't safe. Get off. I love that. <laughs> Right, I want to take you all the way back to the beginning. Oh, when I was like doing my go. research this morning, yeah. I found out that you have a sports science and social science degree. And Look you at did you. It, and you did it in Loughborough University. Yeah. I, I just like, I don't even go back there with you because I know you for who you are now. 
Mm. So you were always interested in sport broadcasting. Well, it's... Uh, uh, who am I, Amber? <laughs> Here we go. Who am I? Yeah, I've, I, I had so many different channels and routes and paths and and I've ended up here. So yeah. it can't have gone too far wrong. But to go back even further as to how I'm in this seat talking to you about working in the theatre world, I was all... If I at school as a kid, if I wasn't playing sport, I was on a, I was on a stage. OK. So I always wanted to... Like, I remember being 11, maybe younger not being old enough to be in the school production of Bugsy Malone. And, and I was you. desperate to be. I was like, I can't wait to be in, in, in the production from next year, like running around the school, just watching like the whole school would get involved from like carpentry building the set or, you know, the art department doing the backdrop. And I just, I just was soaking it up from a really early age. Yeah. So I was always from, from all the way till I was 18. I was so in every also, school so production. So you always had an instinct to do it from so I, I was age. always doing, I did theatre studies... GCSC. It was it was a huge part of my world, but it was never a realistic career as far as I was led to believe or kind of like my school, it was never something that we had a theatre, which was an amazing yeah. luxury, incredible resource to have. But it was never like, oh, you can actually get a job in this. So I was I looked in I feel another like direction. The thing is, if you haven't got anybody around you that's done it, how are you meant to know? Yeah. You that's know? kind of, that's kind of that it. Is it. And even going into telly, nobody had a clue. But at least when you're asked the question, like in a careers meeting with a teacher who's 50 years older than you, like, what do you want to do? I was like, um, I want to do something I enjoy and I like watching telly, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And they, they were like looking at me completely blank face, like, I, d- I don't know how you, you, you plan on that. doing that. So I kind of, I looked up some old dusty books. And Did you? Um, yeah, that's how I ended up going to Loughborough because I knew they had a, a really big media centre there so there was student telly and student magazine and radio and i could play i played hockey to quite a high level so i, I saw wanted that to you go, were a bit of a sports well yeah i mean i went to loughborough and realized that i wasn't going to be a, a professional sports person because okay. everybody else was already going to the olympics <laughs> so i was like um yeah okay well this was fun while it lasted <laughs> let's break away before it's too late and that idea of like getting somewhere and you're not making it is quite a difficult thing, but I came to it quite early with sport. You have for to me. be very logical. Like, were yeah. you just like black and white? Like, this isn't going to happen, so I need to change direction. Yeah, kind of. I've always kind of had a bit of a until maybe since parenthood. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing with that. But before that, <laughs> I've always kind of had a, a map as to where the best route for me is and, and trying to sort of join the dots to make yeah. it happen. So, yeah, I went to Loughborough University and I was doing... I was doing sports science and social science. I mean, I spent... I spent... Don't tell Mama, but I didn't spend many hours studying the course. I was spending more time in dark rooms editing student television. Wow, yeah. OK. That's what so I was doing. So, for our listeners... Yeah. From 2008 to 2013, you were a presenter on Newsround on the CBBC. Yeah. So that, that was your in. That's when I started. And how did you book that job? I, I got told I got the job on my last day of university. <gasps> I got so drunk. <laughs> yeah. Shock. <laughs> what a shock. Edinburgh. So I met... The the guy who was going to become the head of children, so he had he had another senior position at, at CBBC, but I was doing a uh, kind of networking program mm. in Edinburgh for young people, and was get trying to well, it was networking, so you're trying to meet lots of different people and end up getting along really well with the guy who was to become the head of children's. So I still had another year of university, so I was just stayed in touch with him. He was like, make sure you get a show reel together. And I did, and I got it in the right hands. And then little did I know, Newsround were looking for new presenters. So and that was it. Boom. Auditions. Last day of term. Sorry, what? Okay. Thanks. Um, vodka, please. <laughs> one audition? Just one? <laughs> just one. One screen test. Yeah. It was quite just... involved, so I had to go down to London, which is always a big thing. If you don't Ooh. live in London, the idea of driving down to London for what could be your big break at 21 was terrifying but you did it yeah but you're infectious your energy's infectious you know so of course you were going to get it oh and then you went on to present match of the day kickabout 
That was one of our wonderful children's shows. Yeah, that was like a it was like a football show for kids. Nice. Yeah. So I spent I spent five years at, at CBBC, five and a half years. Left in twenty thirteen. Had the best time, and I think it's it's funny because I remember doing Match Day Kickabout, which is essentially a football show for kids. But we were thinking, how can we make this sort of pop a bit more? We didn't really have like any money or any resources. Okay. So our job is to try to think outside the box. How are we going to make engage kids mm. in a sport they already know and love, and they would just want to see the highlights. So a lot of that show was me dressing up and doing funny accents. Oh. Doing sketches. We're going to have to try and find Don't, some of that footage. No. I, I know where they are. They're locked down. You need the passcodes. Listen. And you're not getting the passcodes. I am the best <laughs> stalker one <laughs> can wish for. I can find uh, anything. I mean, they're quite funny to look at. It was, and anyone who has worked for in children's telly will tell you that it's the best foundation for so many yeah. areas of work in telly or beyond. I feel like a lot of people Because you do so like much. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about some of the icons of telly in you know recent times at the deck holly will be laura whitmore um, laura's done children's yeah there's there's loads going back andy peters come on you know yeah the broom cupboard so yeah and you do so much whether it's sport or comedy or entertainment or live i did six <laughs> years of live telly yeah on that's CBC. what i want to ask you what is the difference between live and not live like how do you even deal with that well, I think because I started doing live. Okay. So it wasn't harder because it was just like, that was my training. Like, talk about learning on the job. Yeah. I, me I remember sometimes we've had, we had shows and so you're doing the news to kids, but essentially they're using, it's the same kind of resource as the six o'clock news. Okay. So like proper editors and you're going in the newsroom and then, you know, you're seeing like George Guy or Fiona Bruce over there. You're like, oh, we're doing a little show for children, but... Don't be shit still. Yeah. And you might be getting a VT package. It's like, we're going on air in five minutes and it's still not there. You don't, we, we don't have the footage, but we need three minutes to fill yet. <gasps> and I'm, my anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I'm 22 and I'm going, I've never done this before. And this is on BBC One. So at the time, you know, Children's is now online or digital. But at the time it was on BBC One. So, you know... So you started basically there. You started there going, don't be shit, which is all of our mantras. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do, just don't be shit. But that was, yeah, it was a massive learning curve. And I spent five and a half amazing years doing it. But you know the thing that I, I never say goodbye, because I never, I never say goodbye to anyone. It's always kind of... See you soon. See you soon. I went on an attachment to Radio 5 Live. But I never yeah, that's what I've got here, Radio 5 Live. Yeah. You, did you do a New Year Live programme? Yeah, I did. Do you know what's serendipitous and ironic and coincidental and crazy? I did New Year's Live in 2015. Yeah. With Brian Adams. <gasps> so Brian Adams wrote the music for Pretty Woman the Musical. I first met him nearly 10 years ago when he was bringing in 2016 on BBC One in front of 30 million people. And he was doing All Summer 69 and all the rest of it. And then at just before midnight, I do an interview with him to say, wow, how amazing to bring in the new year with the UK. What are you looking forward to next year? And uh, uh, and and then you say, you know, here comes the fireworks. He does another gig. And then I say, well, I'll see you in 2040, 20, 2023 2020. to do your musical Pretty Woman you haven't written yet. That's <laughs> crazy. So that was pretty wild when he, when he turned up in rehearsal. I was like, I have met you once. Did he not remember? He actually did, or he maybe showbiz said he did. Okay. But he looked like he did. He looked did he? he looked happy like, enough oh, to. He was like, yeah. No, hey. I, I think he remembered the gig because you would remember bringing in New Year's Eve yeah. on BBC One in the mm. UK. Maybe this face was a bit more blurry, but he was very kind about oh, it. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that he was humble like that. Yeah. Now it's time for a quick interval. Go and powder your noses and we'll see you in two. Talking about 2016, that was a big year for you, wasn't it? Yeah, a few things happened. A few things, things changed. happened. Not many people can say, I won't strictly come dancing, but this man can. Hello. Yeah. <sighs> when that offer came Gosh. through, what was your thought process? Well, I 
had a lot of friends. I was working full time at the BBC, so it was, it's the biggest thing mm. on the telly. And I was compared it strictly when it was at Television Centre in London. I was compared it to being like to me being like Charlie Bucket and strictly being like Wonka's factory. Oh. Because I always like looked through the pearly gates, go, wouldn't it be incredible to be part of that one mm. day? But I knew a lot of people who had been asked, and they, you know, some people are asked years and years um, yeah, and still cut. don't make mm. the cut. So I remember having an, uh, a chat with the talent exec and the executive producer, and I was like, oh my God, they know who I am. That's crazy. Yeah. I might get to do the show in five years. That was the April. And then in the July that year, my agent called me up and sang the theme tune down the phone. I was like, I can't hear what you're, what is that? Oh my, is this supposed to be funny? Is this how, and that's how she was telling me that I got the, got the gig. So I, I actually remember telling my mum at the time and she, I said, I've got some news for you. I had my wife on the phone. She thought I was going to tell her that we were having a baby. Oh. <laughs> Like, oh, not yet. Strictly, <laughs> anyway. is that as good? She was so unimpressed. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is iconic. Yeah. Like, no, mum, I'm going yeah. on the best going, TV like, show. That's what I really want. Like, <laughs> to dance on the telly. Not have a what? baby. How do you even know me? <laughs> and then to go on and win it, were you a favourite? I've got to say, I didn't watch your. That's your okay, season. Darling. That's okay. It was a long time ago. You well, were only I, I, was a baby. Third, I was in third year. I was in third year of college. Yeah. I was partying in London. <laughs> I wasn't watching Strictly in my third year at college. It's Saturday night. I'm 21. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, Go out in London. Yeah. Did you have a feeling you'd win it? Nope. Not even until Tess said it. Really? For the whole time. No, no. We were rank outsiders. We were rank outsiders from the beginning, and even in the final, we were rank outsiders. Our mantra, myself and Joanne, who I was just still so close with today. Our mantra was just like, let's enjoy it for what mm. we can. Enjoy yeah. every single aspect of it. I spent so much of my time just in wardrobe, just chatting or just like, just wandering around in a dressing gown, just trying to soak up. Because like I said, I'd been, I was Charlie Bucket with the golden freaking yeah. ticket. I was in. I so I just wanted to sort of take every single aspect of it in. And then like, just... Try just try to make it one week after the next, and so just be present it. and enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, we knew we were, we had something pretty special as a pair, but you would have no idea. You know this. You have no idea how people are going to vote. Yeah, but it does that be on your control? Yeah. So no, we were just like really enjoy. I loved rehearsal. I was every morning. I was. I mean, again, I tell you about feeling like I'm I'm broken today. Every morning before Strictly, and again, this girl knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. I was like, I feel like a bag of bones that someone's just <laughs> gone over with a pestle and mortar. And then, right, dance with that. <laughs> Go. I was broken, but I couldn't wait. So we like danced for 12 hours. I love that. I feel like no one would have been enjoying themselves more than you. Like Maybe. Just, just to be there, just to be there. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, that was... Even if you were just filling a seat as an audience member, you'd freaking <laughs> yeah. love yourself. Totally. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is 2016. There was no Instagram, really. Mm -hmm. I it was kind of there, but it wasn't. I remember one of the um, members of the crew coming and filming something for us, and then uh, he left. I remember coming up to him, like, three days later, going, where was that thing that you recorded? He was like, oh, no, that, that was an Instagram story. They're only up for 24 hours and then they're gone. I was like, oh, I don't know what the point of that is. That it was nothing. Twitter was the Twitter was king. Yeah, Twitter um, was king. And Facebook? Facebook, yeah, kind of, but not as much. But so it was just a completely different world. So you really could just enjoy the TV show. Yeah. Enjoy the experience. Again, it's so much down to the partner. And Simon's such an absolute ledge. Joanne made my experience. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. made it, my it, experience. It does make an, a hell of a lot of difference if you're just on the same wavelength as your partner. Yeah. And you but want to work hard. And they are, Joanne, only two years before, had been crowned the world show dance champion. And so now, you're literally getting trained by the best in the world. She's in musicals. It's her fault that I'm here. Totally. Is it? Yeah, totally her fault. Because that's my next question. Yeah. When did you think... 
do you know what? I want to be on stage. Did that, did Strictly give you the taste for it? It reminded me how much I loved it when I was a kid. Yeah. That was it. And I guess there's there's a lot of people, especially on Strictly, because there's such a wide spectrum of people that will do it. Mm. All sorts of different levels of celebrity or talent. But a lot of people go on that show and want to run away. Yeah. And it's just not for me at all. Yeah. Like, how? Give me the money and eliminate me. I want to go home. Yeah. But I remember being on that stage, all the nervousness and just wanting to bank up all the trainers, as much trainers as we could, and that was going to give you the the solidarity that you could perform, give you the confidence that you could perform. Um, but I remember it being go time and just being able to kind of harness those emotions and being like, there is no greater thrill than being on this stage, seeing 500 people mm. in the room, knowing that it's going out to millions. I was like, that's not normal. No, <laughs> If you're enjoying that, you're not normal, then you should probably think about doing something about it. But Joanne was already a musical theatre geek, aficionado, lover. She was she was obsessed with it. Right. So if we were taking a break, she was she was kind of singing or going through another different number, or we were watching videos of like old school like MGM movies right. and you know Fred Astaire stuff. We we did a number of Gene Kelly and that singing in the rain number that we did in week three, I think, kind of set up our whole series Experience. and so yeah i was just by osmosis was just like picking up her love and obsession for music oh, theater. Was reminding you yeah you know? i was just like okay well because I, I was such a sponge like whatever you're doing mm. i'm gonna try my best to replicate it. yeah so it was just kind of going in she was reprogramming me so you did you you did your debut your stage debut on the grease tour yeah in 2019 yeah, yeah. As Teen Angel. Yes. Sharing the role with Mr. Peter Andre. With Pete, yeah. That's kind of iconic. Yeah, it, I don't think I could have asked for a better start because I finished Strictly in 2016 and I knew from 2017 that I wanted to make a, a go in, in, in theatre but I wasn't exactly sure how to piece it together. And I think, it, you know... There might have been a role that landed straight away and it might have been the wrong one. You know, it's yeah. it, you can sink or swim in these things. And I wasn't ready was basically the thing. I totally wasn't ready. Yes, the profile after winning a show at Strictly was through the roof. Mm. But that means if you are pants, that good luck working again. Yeah. Because, because people, you know, the the appreciation that I have after working in musicals for five, six years now to then, like... This is this is a twenty years worth of work that's gone into being up there and performing mm. brilliantly eight times a week. Mm. There's nothing mediocre about it. No. And so I, I knew that quite early on and wanted to make sure that I was up to scratch. Okay. But the great thing about Greece was that it, you talk about a musical that everybody already loves. They're, they're, they're yeah, you can't go wrong time. with you Greece. You can't kind of go wrong. And and I was sharing the role with with Pete. I mean, sure, there might have been people that turned up thinking that Pete was going to be on and they got me. <laughs> and, well, I would have loved uh, to see you, just so I you know. I appreciate that. And I would have needed a lot more of your tickets to cover the refunds for those poor sods. <laughs> no, <laughs> Where's Pete? Say- Where's Pete? <laughs> Where's Pete? That yeah. did not happen. There were no riots in Leeds. Thank there were no God. riots, but I did get a couple of threats, no. No, of course not. Everyone was really lovely. But the, the thing was, it was already like, it was it was a positive start. The teen mm. Angel, he comes on, he sings one big number in Act Two, and yeah. then he goes, he comes back at the finale. That's it. Yeah. So it was a really lovely, gentle start, and Pete was really like welcoming. We met for don't go into a shopping centre <laughs> with Peter Andre. Why is it bad? Because if you go through the perfume section of the department store, <laughs> don't you won't be anywhere for forty five minutes. That was, I would like to think that was a mistake, but I also know Pete, and I actually think maybe he was selling an album, maybe it was a really good way of just harnessing the audience, (laughs) because he walks through the shopping centre in Leeds, and it was like the Pied Piper, but he just smelt really good. 
It was hilarious. <laughs> they obsessed. just came. You've never seen Elemis, Dior, <laughs> and kind of. <laughs> You've never seen all of these all of these different departments come together just to say hi to Peter Andre. I love that. And I was the guy taking the pictures. Yeah, were you? Yeah, of course. So no, it was a really lovely start. Ori's also done the Rocky Horror Show, which you did the tour and then came into London with it. Yeah, yeah. Fiftieth anniversary, that F- was. Wow. Big deal. I love that. You then did your West End debut in Curtains. West End debut was Curtains with Jason Manford at the Wyndham's Theatre, yeah. And did you love that? I uh, intimidated. Really? We, well, yeah, we haven't got time to talk about my imposter syndrome. And if anybody else was talking to me about it, I would go, d- smack yourself around the chops, have a look at yourself, what are you talking about? You are there, you are in the role, you are present. Nobody is the perfect version of themselves until you're gone, right? So mm. so you keep working to where you want to get to. But in that instance, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm actually here in the West End. Oh gosh! Like who's who's going to be in the room? Yeah, it, I found it quite in, quite intimidating. And has the more you work, has the imposter syndrome lessened? Kind of, because I've only got older, and so the ex, the experience I've added more experience, and I'd like to think I'm improving in the right direction. But at the same time, you're like I still can't tap. Or, <laughs> Who or cares? I, I can't I can't belt a ridiculous flat <laughs> or something. And I think more and more it, it, it becomes very apparent that I, I you know my my route in I didn't have the twenty years training that a lot of guys in in the room have. So it sometimes you can't bank on that. You know sometimes if it was telly like oh I started in two thousand and eight before then two thousand and six was my first time in a television studio. I can go. Right. I know I should be here because I've got this wealth yeah. of experience. But when you only have four or five years, I can imagine you after leaving Erdang four or five years in, you're a very different person to who yeah, you are correct. today. So I, I know I'm talking out of my arris, but I also, <laughs> I also, it's it's there. It's a quiet voice, but it occasionally gets louder. But that's, um, it, that's lovely for the listeners to hear that, like, look how successful you are. And you still do it. You know, it's normal. Yeah. It's yeah. completely normal. I think with, with experience and the people around you, like you should know your worth. You know, you're amazing. It's, I would say exactly the same thing to everybody else. Exactly. Know your worth is totally the thing. You are in there. You got the job on merit. You are, and especially when you get a role. So then, when you finish the role, like you're a very different person. Yeah. You've 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 worked on it, and there's there's always lots of things you can be doing. So I know I'm talking. I know I'm talking rubbish, but it's it's definitely a thing. I just feel like in this industry, if we started talking to ourselves the way that we talk to others, we'd feel much better about ourselves, you know? Too right. Too right, hon. Quick! I Because uh, I'm running out of time with Ori, I could sit here with him all friggin' day. We'll have to do um, the spin off. Yeah. <laughs> Episode two <laughs> SAS, who dares win? Right. Just uh, g- give me a sentence of, <laughs> of that experience to round it up. Oh my gosh. SAS, who dares wins? Uh, it was lockdown 2020, so enough was going on already. Yeah. But it was arguably, aside from having children, the most life-defining two weeks of my life. And are you glad you did it? <laughs> I am so glad I did it because, I, essentially, you are learning from people who have spent over 100 years between them in the Special Forces. Wow. Of, of like how how to live your life. You know, they're not training you to become special service personnel, but they're giving you their experience. Mm. So it's up to you whether you want to use it or not. So I know if my back is against the wall and I'm feeling really rubbish, that I know I've got metal in me that I never knew existed four years ago. Wow, I love and that. And that's a really powerful thing. Yeah. Because it's definitely, in those four years, it's definitely got me through a lot of things that maybe a few years ago I would have cracked and given up on but I don't give up no you don't that's that show has helped me and where can our listeners go and watch that oh sadly it is still on channel 4 on demand don't because do it do it because do it. It, it's the it's pretty dark it's I actually dark wa- I watched it during rehearsal yeah you did and I just wish I wish I hadn't watched it after I'd <laughs> met him because I was like no 
my my Ore. <laughs> he's suffering. He's crying. Yeah. He's in. His eyes he's are cold. stinging. He thinks he's going to die again. <laughs> now, final question is from Instagram. So our listeners writing questions yeah, yeah. and the one that i picked out for you because i just know it's going to be gold <laughs> is what's your favorite mishap that's happened oh, on stage where uh, do we start well uh, and uh, i there are a few and sadly quite recently <laughs> i and sadly they involve you actually I mean, you've 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 been the one you've I said the benefactor. I was the one receiving you were the it. one who received my my absolute <laughs> mishap. Uh, the, the, the one that I'm most regretful of is when I left you hanging. Mm. I left you on stage. Um, I'll never forgive you. For that. I'm supposed to walk on and say goodbye to Vivian, and I just I just got my timing wrong. And it's a very quick window from when you say goodbye to when you come round to me. And maybe, what was it? Maybe five or six seconds, which is, feels like a lifetime. Yeah, I just thought to myself, how am I going to get to the next scene if Ori's not going to come out? <laughs> and then by the time I thought, what could I do? You were there, you know? Yeah, no excuse for that. The worst one most recently, because I'd had a bit of trouble. I was going to go off. We had a two shows out. I was going to go off in the second show, so I wasn't feeling great. And I'd, I'd made the call that I was going to do the show. and I, but, but, of course, I'm still in a show, so I, I have to finish it. And that's, she's laughing because she knows you're, again, how graphic do we get? But you things in your body were, were getting... Twitching. T- twitching. Getting bigger and smaller. And I, I had to come on, and it's the same moment. It's it the, same the same moment. moment. There's something cursed about it. This time I turned up on time... I remember just starting my goodbye to you, bringing on the Julio character uh, as played beautifully by Noah Harrison. And in that moment, I knew what was to come, but I forgot what was to happen right now. And I remember I'm supposed to go have the hotel limo take uh, Vivian anywhere she wishes to go. And I just went, okay, well, I know I've got to say goodbye to Mr. Lewis Edward later. <laughs> So I just said, Mr. Lewis, um, I'm taking your things. And I was just looking down, forgetting there were 3,000 people there. And then, and then Noah, Noah was sweating his nuts off. You, I couldn't even look at. I was just looking at you like that, like... What? He's having a malfunction. Come on, come on, get in out. Get in out. I said, Mr. Lewis. I said, uh, Miss Vivian. Vivian. And I just made up some words. I but said, the, 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 the mm. sentence you gave me did not... No, it was no in sense. English. No, no, I just, I said, I just put words out, something about a limousine, off and go. <laughs> and it was, oh, you want... There is a pit, actually. You know, talk about, like, the, the ground opening up. There is a pit right in front of us. I could have jumped in it. <laughs> I could have jumped in it and ended it there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the thing is, is, like, not one part of me thought, should I help him? I just thought, do you know what? This is far too entertaining for me. <sighs> Great. I'm so I'm just going to lo- watch him suffer. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, we're only halfway through the tour. Imagine what more pearls there are to come. I know, I will keep you guys updated, but for now, (laughs) this is all we've got time for today, but you have just been so wonderful. You're so honest and kind, and we're going to be sharing the stage with each other in about five hours. Yeah, so... I look forward to it. Best go with my lines. Yeah, yeah, especially that one. (laughs) But thank you so much for listening, and Ori, thank you so much for coming here today. I'll see you on stage, hon. Giving me a bit of your time. Anytime. Thanks, guys. (laughs) 